video to accompany the Barefoot Vodcasting presentation given at the 20th Annual Conference on Distance Teaching and Learning in Madison, Wisconsin. My name is James Moore and I'm here to talk about Barefoot Vodcasting. So my abstract says, learn how to vodcast barefoot, recording face-to-face -face lectures, workshops and presentations without IS or IT support. Using simple tools and techniques, classes can be recorded and then broadcast from any location in the world. The equipment is low cost and easily carried in a laptop bag. Vodcasting can transform the effectiveness of blended classes and enhance the learning experience. Sounds great. How do you do it? My plan is in this video and on the accompanying blog and website to provide a soup to nuts overview of what I refer to as barefoot vodcasting. I'll be outlining three methods that you can employ in the classroom. Now, if you need to get in contact with me with additional questions, you can do so via telephone or email, or you can visit the, the website that accompanies this presentation, which is www paul.edu slash tilde jmore slash barefoot which operates like a blog there are areas where you can add your comments and get in touch with me that site also contains uh, files that you can download there are PDFs there are handouts that I provided at the presentation in Madison that you have access to and can share with your colleagues so I had a problem in my classes. I wanted to faithfully capture the classroom experience and make this available to my students. Now, why did I want to do this? A couple of reasons. The first one is I believe that by recording what I do, this improves the quality of the instructional experience. I think I work better this way. The other reasons were about 20% of my students, English is their second or third language. So providing these files allows them to review what they see in class and better understand the material. The third reason is I teach adult students who have busy jobs. They sometimes cannot come to every single class and having these recordings makes their life a little bit easier. And then the final reason is research has demonstrated that everything you may share in a class is unlikely to be processed and remembered. So if you provide materials and then review, sorry, and then record the process and make this available for review, this definitely improves the learning experience. This makes things life easier for your students. So those are the reasons that I had. You perhaps may have additional reasons. Now you can do this type of thing through um, products which are available in the market that will allow a dedicated classroom to record what's going on. But I'm looking for something different. Uh, podcast producer, Sonic's Foundry Media Site, Tegrity Campus, and Panopto Socrates Coursecast are excellent products, but I'm looking for something different. I'm looking for something that is constrained, um, in that I'm looking for something I can take with me anywhere. So I can bring this into a non networked area, an area where I don't have an internet connection. I'm looking for something that's portable, I can take with me anywhere. Something that's self-supporting, I don't need to rely on IS or IT to help me. I'm looking for something efficient, and I'm looking for something flexible. Those other options didn't work for me, so some of the options I'm going to outline today hopefully are useful to you as well. Now the concept I have here is barefoot. Analogous to the barefoot doctors, that provide primary care in areas that don't have medical infrastructure. So what I'm getting at here is the concept of things that you can carry with you in a bag anywhere that allow you to record the teaching or classroom experience that you can then make available pretty much immediately. The other concept we're working with here is a concept of the podcast, which is the combination of two things, an audio or video file with an RSS subscription to create something that your students or your audience subscribe to. The concept here is there's going to be a regular subscription. You're doing these things on a regular process. And this makes sense for those of you who are educators. If you think about the courses that you teach, 
they probably are a structure that contains multiple classes taught over a daily or weekly basis. So here your students can subscribe and each week they receive updated episodes for your class. Now podcasts fall into three categories and basically what I've done here is color coded these in terms of complexity. At the top we have the regular podcast an audio file which typically has a .mp3 extension. This will play on pretty much any digital device that's out there. Below that in Amber we have the enhanced podcast which is an audio slideshow. This will play on iPods with a screen as well as iTunes and QuickTime on PCs. Here we have a .m4a extension. Now this format lends itself to PowerPoint or keynote presentations. And then lastly we have the video podcast. A little bit more complicated to create but perhaps a little bit more engaging because you're providing video. This will play on iPods of a screen along with iPhones uh, as well as iTunes and QuickTime on Mac and PC platforms. Here we're looking for something with an M4V or MP4 file extension. Now there are three methods I'm going to outline today. My solutions are basic podcasting, vodcasting and pencasting. So I'm going to demonstrate how I use each of these three options to vodcast barefoot. To begin with, with basic podcasting, I use the Sansa Clip. This is a great little device that I've been using for a couple of years now fairly inexpensive and this is a device that clips to a shirt so you can wear it with you as you walk around the room. Notable features are a microphone which records everything that you say and then a USB port that allows you to connect and recharge this device as well as move files off onto your computer where you'll edit things. I said it's inexpensive um, you're looking for something at the low end in terms of 30 to 35 dollars that will allow you to record approximately five to six hours to the eight gigabyte version which costs something between 60 and 80 dollars and this would allow you to record between 40 and 48 hours of content you probably don't need to do that um, so you'll be happy with something in between I typically use a two or four gig device now this device as I said earlier, you can fix to your shirt. So the great thing here is you walk around the room, you don't have the fixed microphone problem. If you have a room which has a microphone fixed to a particular location, as you move around the room, you're moving in and out of the recording field. So your voice gets louder and quieter as you move to and away from the microphone. If you're wearing the microphone, we don't have this problem. You walk around the room, the microphone goes around the room with you. Your recording sounds stellar. But there are some changes to your behavior that you need to follow. The first one is you have to decide what you will record. Just because you can record everything in the classroom doesn't mean you should record everything in the classroom. There are some things that you may choose not to record, particularly uh, areas where you review midterms or finals or areas where your students start to explore potentially embarrassing topics. These are things that you probably don't want to record. In terms of behavior, you're going to want to repeat or rephrase questions that come to you. Something along the lines of, let me repeat that. Your observation or your question was. You're going to want to tell your students, preferably in the syllabus, that you record classes so they know about this before they turn up. And you want to remind them that technology can always fail. You cannot guarantee that every class will be recorded perfectly. Now I follow a fairly simple process for recording. If I'm teaching a three hour class, I want to inject breaks to make the life easier for me and for my students. So with a three hour class, I'll typically have two breaks. And with this process, I have three separate recordings that I create. As I start to talk about something, I press start recording on the Sansa clip. As the break starts, I press stop recording and I save that recording. 
After the break, I start recording the next segment. So discrete files are created. After the class, typically the next day, I import these WAV files into Audacity. I trim the recording, removing dead air in front of and after the recording, and then export this as an MP3 file and add metadata from a template. Audacity is free software that runs on the Mac OS X, Windows, and on Linux. You can download it from audacity.sourceforge.net. As you do this, you'll also want to install the lame MP3 encoder. This plugin allows you to export MP3s. Without the plugin, you won't be able to do this. Instructions are provided on the web. Now I mentioned a template. The template is used in two ways. The first way is to provide a naming convention for the files that I create. Um, what I'm doing here is providing my name, the name of the class, and where it falls in the weekly structure and which part of the week's recording has been provided. So something like jmore-marketing-595-301, which is the section number, hyphen week one, hyphen part one, hyphen 2009.mp3. I'll use this template as well for the metadata. And here I'm providing the title, artist, album, track number, genre, and comments. So on screen you can see an example of the type of format I recommend. Now the Sansa Clip records in WAV format. These are large high fidelity files. Typically you're looking at something in the region of 175 megabytes for a one hour recording. When Audacity compresses this file, they'll move it down to something in the region of 50 megabytes in size. Not too large, something you can distribute to your students. In terms of distribution, I use iTunes U. This is something that Apple provides free of charge to educational institutions. It's not the only option, but it's free and easy to use. So this is one format that I use. Alternatives to this are available. And I've moved these into three categories. On the left, things that you pay for are your learning management system. So Blackboard, eCollege, Desire to Learn, or Moodle might be platforms that you use in which you can upload these files to. Alternatively, you can pay for something. So I see a lot of faculty use their own personal websites to distribute files here. One on One, Bluehost, and GoDaddy are all companies that I've used that I recommend. Or you can go the free route and use services like mypodcast.com or podbean.com to distribute these files. What I have seen is students have a tendency to um, look down somewhat on free services and think that services that you pay for um, are basically more trustworthy. So this is a determination that you may have to make depending on the type of course that you're teaching. Now, today we're talking about vodcasting and the Sansa Clip creates a podcast, an audio file. The reason I've um, mentioned this is I use this as my backup method. If I'm creating a video file, if I'm using a pencast, I'll use the Sansa Clip as well as a backup. If technology fails, I have this audio recording to use or to import into the other software that I may use. So I use this always. So part two of today's presentation is vodcasting the video podcasting. Here um, we're using the area that is coded red, the video podcast. Slightly more complicated to create but slightly more engaging and less ambiguous in terms of content. Now there are some considerations as you do this. Your teaching style dictates what and how you will record. If you're using overhead projectors, if you're somebody who uses a chalkboard or a whiteboard, Video might not be the appropriate medium, the appropriate channel for you to use. So pen casting, which I'll cover later, might be a better alternative for you. 
So think about things. Plan the ideal channel to use that matches, that embraces and extends your teaching style. So with vodcasting, things get a little bit more complicated. From my perspective, this is what I want to record and share. On the left, the thing that's most important to me is content. This is the information that I show via computer on a projector on the screen in the room. I want to record anything and everything that's on the screen. So this might be a keynote or PowerPoint presentation, but it's also going to include websites that I visit, videos that I may show, software that I demonstrate, and other similar items. So basically anything that I can do on my computer is content that I want to record. Now this is non-ambiguous. On the left, and less important to me, is context. Basically a video of me in the room, moving around, demonstrating things. Now this context is non-verbal sometimes, or provides nuance. Less important for the particular classes I teach, but perhaps more important for other classes. If you're teaching something that is a language skills class, body movement may be important to you. If you're teaching something that's highly nuanced, body movement may be very important to you. If you're teaching social skills, this video may be very important to you. Anyway, there are three platforms that you can use in the classroom. There's Linux, there's Mac, OS X, and there's Windows. And on each of these three platforms, there's software that you can use. I've used all three, but I have a particular preference. On Linux, we have Record My Desktop. On Mac OS X, we have ScreenFlow. And then on Windows, we have Camtasia. My favorite software is ScreenFlow. It's a little bit cheaper than Camtasia. I find it considerably easier to use. And it also has instant encoding which allows me to save a file immediately after pressing stop record. Camtasia currently doesn't do this. So this becomes a problem if I want to record separate segments in a class. Sometimes the encoding process takes long, longer than the break between segments. So Camtasia doesn't work as readily for me. That's not to say you can't use it. You might have to record an entire class, breaks included, with the current version of Camtasia. But if Mac OS X is available to you, ScreenFlow, I think, is the better route to follow. So the next couple of pages are sort of outline how I use ScreenFlow. The big picture recommendations, uh, the process that I follow, is applicable to Camtasia, however. So here's what I use in the classroom. My basic equipment is to walk in with a Sansa clip, which I'm going to use to record audio. I'm also going to use a Zoom H2 microphone, which I connect via USB cable to my laptop. Uh, on my laptop, I have ScreenFlow as my recording software, and this results in a recording that I can share with my students. The Zoom H2 is a great little device around the size of a deck of playing cards which is a field recorder. You can put batteries in there and a secure digital card and you can pretty much put this down anywhere in the room and record using the four microphones on the device to record in a 360 degree field of recording or to record from the front of the device. Or you can do what I do with a USB cable you plug this into your laptop and then you have a fixed microphone that synchronizes the audio recording. I choose to use a shielded USB cable which reduces the chance of wireless interference on my recording. In terms of preparation, for an 11 week class um, I know that I'm probably going to have a midterm and a final. This means that two out of the 11 weeks are not being used for recordings. So in terms of structure, we can view my class as having nine separate albums. Of these albums, because I'm breaking the class into three segments, there are three parts. 
With this information, I can create appropriate images and course, course artwork, as well as presentation titles for weeks one through four and weeks six through 10. With this preparation as well, I can create an appropriate metadata template. This is the naming structure that I'm going to use for all subsequent classes. And by following this template, I ensure that the naming structure, the metadata is consistent. So here are the fields I'm going to use. Naming convention, album, artist, author, copyright, description, director, full name, genre, information, producer, track, and URL link. So on screen, you can see some examples and recommendations. Now, because I'm using the Mac, I can use a program called Automator to simplify this process. I can use an Automator workflow to go through and apply this information quickly to my files. You can find out more about Automator, which is available free of charge from www.apple.com slash downloads slash Mac OS 10 slash automator. Again, I follow a similar structure for recording. As I start a segment, I start recording. And then at the break, I stop and save that recording. After the break, I start to record again. So in a three hour class with two breaks, I'm going to have three separate recordings. I take these and import them into ScreenFlow. I trim the recording, removing the junk and dead air at the start and end of the recording, add credits and perhaps an image at the start and end of the video, and then export this as either an M4V or a .mov file. And then I apply metadata and start to distribute this with my students. Now, one format I use to distribute the downloadable file is iTunes U. Same thing I was using for the audio recordings. Uh, this is a great way that I can either provide private or public files. So either anyone in the world or just my students can see these recordings. And just to recap, a couple of notes of why I chose ScreenFlow and this process. A built-in redundancy. I'm creating two recordings, one audio and one video recording. So if ScreenFlow does not work for me, I had my audio backup to use. If audio doesn't work on my ScreenFlow video, then I can import stuff from the Sansa clip. ScreenFlow encodes immediately, so I can stop recording during the break. And ScreenFlow provides powerful editing functions, which I find very efficient to use. Now, there are alternative methods of distribution, and I use one of these along with iTunes U. On the left, we have learning management systems. So you can upload files to Blackboard eCollege Desire to Learn a Moodle. Or you can use paid hosting services like Podomatic or Uyala to provide streamed content. So along with iTunes U, I upload video files to be streamed from Uyala. So here there's a cost. Um, I can use free services. EduTube, TeacherTube, and YouTube are available free of charge for me to use. But again, there's this trade-off in terms of cost and trust that you may want to consider. So here's the skinny on some of the free services. EduTube allows you to upload up to 200 megabytes of files. You can apply privacy through groups. TeacherTube doesn't have a limit on file size and also allows embedding. And YouTube for EDU has no length restrictions but a limit of one gigabyte in file size. The other restriction is you have to be a qualifying two or four year degree granting public or private college and university to use this service. Um, otherwise, if you're using YouTube, you're typically restricted to content, content that is no longer than 10 minutes in duration. Other things to consider are services like Blip TV, which has free or paid options. And here we're looking at between um, looking at something in the region of $8 per month, which allows you to upload one gigabyte files. You can also provide um, privacy. You can use the pro account to hide your videos if required. 
Podomatic has three options. Um, you can pay nothing and have 15 gigabytes of bandwidth. You can pay approximately $10 a month and you get 100 gigabytes of bandwidth. Or you can play, pay just shy of $15 a month and get 200 gigabytes of bandwidth. And then there are others. Uyala, I mentioned. Uyala is a service I use. I like it because the hosting service is rock solid and the system affords me statistics on how many students are viewing my recordings and better still, how many students watch the videos in entirety, which can be very helpful to you and perhaps a little bit depressing. Anyway, you can also look at VO or Vimeo as platforms to distribute streamed content. In terms of file size, uh, here's what you're likely to be looking at. I mentioned earlier that if you use the Sansa clip and you're recording an hour of content, the file size is in the region of 175 megabytes. When you crunch that down to an MP3 file, it's in the region of 50 megabytes. Video is going to be larger. When you use ScreenFlow, the raw recording which is saved to your hard drive for one hour of content is probably going to be in the region of 185, sorry, 850 megabytes to one and a half gigabytes in size. Now this is the raw recording. This isn't content you're saving with your students, but this means you need to have free space on your laptop and generally I am looking to have at least 10 gigabytes of free space on my drive before I start recording. When you export this from ScreenFlow, you're looking to get something in the region of 250 to 350 megabytes. And if you crunch this down further as an M4V file, you're probably going to have something between 180 to 280 megabytes in size. Now, Video file size will be affected by the complexity of your recording. If you have detailed images, animation or video, then file size is going to be larger because compression is harder to accomplish. So your mileage may vary here. Now, I'd like to improve the process. I mentioned earlier there are two things I would like to record. We have the content, the non-ambiguous um content I'm providing. I also want to record context. Me in the room, moving around, interacting with people. And here I'm going to have non-verbal or nuance. Um, less important, but this is something I would like to record. Now the way I'm going to do this is to record video into the ScreenFlow recording. Now I can do this through a fixed camera or in post-production. In terms of fixed cameras, there are a couple of options I looked at, so I'm going to run through the advantages and disadvantages of what is available. To start with, we have a device called the Huckleberry, which sits on top of your EyeSight camera. And this sort of works like a periscope. It allows you to record on the back side, the, the far side of your laptop, the area that doesn't have the camera sticking out from it. Um, this is sometimes useful. Uh, great little device, but I have a tendency not to use this option when I'm recording in a classroom. I do use this for some specific situations where I may be in the audience and recording something, but if I'm the presenter, I have a t tendency not to use the Huckleberry for two reasons. Reason number one is the Huckleberry is fixed to the laptop screen, which wobbles slightly if the podium moves as I move near the podium or wobbles because I type on the keyboard. The second reason is this means I need to position the laptop anticipating where I'm going to be walking around and I have a tendency perhaps to walk to the laptop to advance slides or to demo software. So probably not the ideal situation. Alternatively I can plug in a camera via cable and position it as I need in the room. So here, in, f in terms of Firewire, um, I could use the iSight camera that Apple used to sell but no longer does so. Or I could use the Unibrain Fire Eye. Now the Fire Eye is a device that can be daisy chained, so you can connect multiple Firewire devices to it. 
retails for approximately hundred dollars at the moment now we can extend the cable length between you and your camera by using an extender which can again be daisy chains you can pick up something for about 25 bucks that allows you to do this firewire is going to have a greater degree of detail um, if firewire is not an option then you can use usb cameras the picture quality isn't as good um, but the cost is a little bit less so one product that i use and recommend at the moment is the logitech qc3000 for business you can pick these up for about twenty eight dollars uh, you can affix them to a tripod it has a tripod mount and again we can use extension cables such as the trip light active extension cable uh, these again can be daisy chained which allows us a opportunity to move the camera to the back of the room the downside to this approach is you now have a cable which snakes across the room which will either trip up you or your students which is not a good thing so you have to decide whether this is a viable option for what you're going to be doing you don't want to create a classroom hazard The other approach you could consider is recording something and then in post-production importing this video file into your ScreenFlow or Camtasia software and synchronizing it with the computer recording and the audio recording that you've already created. There are four devices on screen which I have tested extensively over the past six to seven months, one of which uh, I highly recommend. A device that I don't have on screen at the moment that I think is worthy of consideration is the new Kodak camera. I don't like the Kodak ZI6. I don't think the video or audio recording is particularly good. But the new device they have I think is a significant improvement and has the opportunity for you to plug in a separate microphone to the camera. This is something that none of the devices on screen currently have. So something worthy of consideration. On the blog, I'll provide a link to the Kodak camera. But anyway, out of these four, the way that I look at these cameras is basically through three areas. Cost, battery, recording time, and capacity. So what I'm looking for is something that's affordable, and all these devices are in a sort of similar cost region. I'm looking for a opportunity to remove the battery. So I can put in a fresh battery and extend the recording life of the device. So during the break, I change the batteries, which means I can record subsequent segments of the class. So here, not all cameras have this option. Flip Minnow has an inbuilt battery. So not a viable option for my consideration. I'm also looking at recording time. Since I break my three hour class into three segments, I want to ensure that I can record for at least one hour. Um, and then capacity. I want to ensure that I can put all the video that I'm recording from a class on one device. So the flip minnow isn't going to work for me because the recording time is only one hour and the capacity is two gigabytes. So really I can only record one hour of content on that device. I could bring in three devices to the classroom, but I don't think this is really an option. The Flip Ultra HD has removable, removable batteries, so I can record three hours of content, but the recording time, the capacity of the device, means I can only record two hours of content, so this isn't an option for me. The Kodak ZI6 has removable batteries, it has a recording time in excess of two and a half hours, and it has removable capacity. So this might seem to be the ideal device. The problem is it doesn't have a particularly good field of view. The video quality and the audio quality aren't sufficient to the task. So this leaves me with the Vidu HD. This is my preferred device. Affordable, has a removable battery, recording time in excess of two hours and a capacity of eight gigabytes. That allows me to record eight hours of content because with this device, even though it's an HD device, I can record in VGA which makes sense considering I'm going to compress the video that I share with my students. There is no need to record in HD if I'm going to compress the video. So, to recap, two devices that I think are worthy of consideration. 
The Flip is the device that I just love the look at. It's incredibly easy to use. The quality is probably the best out of all these options here. The design and the ease of use is fantastic, but I think it's only worth considering if filming for one hour or less. The Vidu HD isn't as pretty, but it's the best overall. I can use this with breaks to film a three hour class, and I recommend that you purchase spare batteries. So here is what I'd recommend you do. If you're getting the Vidu HD, you'll be spending $220 on the device. Now, I'd recommend that you purchase a battery charger. This allows you to record, sorry, this allows you to recharge batteries outside of the device. If you plug in the device with the USB connection to your computer, this charges the battery. If you use the battery charger, you can do this without having to plug the device into your computer. So what I do is I have two spare batteries, which I bring to my classes. During the break, I change the batteries in and out of the camera, and I use the battery charger to charge those batteries. So I'm always having fresh batteries that I can swap in and out of the device. This means I am prepared, I'm covered for anything, but I'm spending about 280 bucks. Now, if you have a camera, you're also going to want to use a tripod. So here are some options for you to consider. At the more pocketable end of the spectrum, we have desktop options. I have four on screen. The first, the flexible mini tripod, is something that you can pick up for between 5 and $15, but I recommend that you don't do so. These things have a tendency to break. Legs fall off. I think they're less than ideal. We have the Manfrotto Modo Pocket, which technically isn't a tripod, it only has two legs, but it's incredibly pocketable. Um, you can actually fix this to the bottom of your camera and take it with you. Um, so it's something I carry with me. It's there as a backup device if I forget to pack the more usable tripods, but it's not a recommended option. What I do recommend you purchase is either, or perhaps both, the Gorillapod and or Ultrapod 2. The Gorillapod has flexible legs that you can curve and wrap around things that project from ceilings and walls, or you can stick it on top of a desk. The Ultrapod is somewhat similar in that regard in that it has a Velcro strap that you can use to wrap around objects in the room. So with enough preparation, you could have fixed this to something hanging from the ceiling and ensure that your video is filming an area that has a totally interrupted view of you and your content. If you need to bring in a traditional tripod to the room, then my recommendation is the Manfrotto 785 Modo Maxi Photo Video Grip Head Tripod. The name is a bit of a mouthful, but the tripod is very easy to carry. Packs down to something a little bit smaller than a pocket umbrella. Costs about 60 bucks. Great little device. It has a removable head, so you can purchase multiple heads, multiple mounts that you can fix to your devices and you can slot them in and out of the tripod incredibly swiftly. I use this in some situations where I might want to fix more than one camera to my tripod. There's a great little device that is um, manufactured by Berezin, which is called a twin bar. This, as I said, allows you to fix two cameras to one tripod. This might sound like a daft idea, but I find this particularly helpful in situations where I may be filming role-playing or interviews in the classroom. Rather than having a wide shot which covers the two participants, I can zoom in and focus on the individual participants, and then I can move these videos together in post-production to create something that's a little bit more engaging. So here on screen you can see how I might do this and the way that I position the cameras within the room. I might use this twin bar in situations where I cannot afford for one of these cameras to fail. If there's something that is non-repeatable but very, very important, the twin bar allows me to use two cameras and one tripod. 
In terms of the larger tripods, something that perhaps is less transportable and perhaps shying away from the concept of barefoot vodcasting, I might want to consider the Manfrotto 055X Pro B Pro Tripod, a sturdy device that extends to a greater height than the medium tripod. This I can use at the back of the room and I can ensure it's able to film over the heads of people within the room. Here, this device costs about 85 bucks, but it doesn't have a head. I'll have to purchase an additional one, which is sometimes more expensive than the actual tripod. The one that I recommend at the moment is the Manfrotto 322 RC2 Bullhead. It costs about 110 bucks, but it has this great little pistol grip so I can move the head in such a way that I've focused the shot and I can use the pistol grip to um, change those settings rapidly. Great little device. Another device that is perhaps not strictly speaking barefoot in that it's a little bit heavy to carry around with me is the Manfrotto 31 DDB tripod accessory arm. This is something that you affix to the top of the tripod and allows you to attach four devices. So you could film using four cameras simultaneously or attach a combination of microphones and cameras to record multiple things that are, multiple things that are taking place. It costs about 125 bucks. I have used it in some situations, but typically it's not something you would use in most classes. In terms of camera placement, there's a degree of economical trade-off you're going to have to consider. Sometimes putting your camera at the back of the room is less than ideal in that you might not have an opportunity to place your tripod or camera. You might have people in the way of your field of view. Sometimes putting something at the side of the room and orientating it in such a way that you can capture the podium yourself and the screen is the better option to follow. And then the last video device I want to share is something that has just been released on the market. This is a device that allows me to film wirelessly but synchronize this with the ScreenFlow software that I use. The device is the BT1 Bluetooth webcam. This is a tiny little device with a onboard rechargeable battery that allows me to film continuously for about four hours. So this covers the typical classes that I teach. I can fix this discreetly somewhere at the back of the room or on the ceiling and ensure that this is recording everything that I want to share with my students. The downside to using this device is it films at only 15 frames per second, so the recording can be a little bit jerky, and it can only connect somewhat between 3 to 10 meters within the room. So this means I cannot position this too far away from my laptop. Now this distance can be extended. There are USB devices that you can purchase from the same site, from bt1.com, um, that you plug into your USB port that allow you to position the camera further away. Um, but if you don't have one of these, you're going to have to experiment to see how well this device works within your particular room. You can pick up this for about 150 bucks. If you want to use audio wirelessly, there are some options which I'm sharing on screen. Uh, this is equipment that's been recommended to me uh, by Mike Miley, who works for Apple. Um, it comes highly recommended, but I haven't used wireless audio myself. Um, down to cost, these devices can be a little bit expensive. Also down to size, because these are additional heavy things to cart with me. And also because I'm slightly hesitant to use wireless audio. I have been burnt in the past, but Mike from Apple says these devices are pretty resilient. Anyway, that was vodcasting, so let's talk about pencasting, which is the last option that I want to share. This option is a little bit out there, but this is something definitely worth considering if you're teaching a language course, or if you're somebody who teaches algebra or statistics, where you have a tendency to walk around the room and scribble on a chalkboard or a whiteboard. 
Here we can use this fantastic device called the LiveScribe Pulse Pen. This is a smart pen. You can pick these up from Target or Amazon. They cost uh, about 150 bucks for the one gig version, $200 for the two gig version, which allows you to record 200 hours of audio. You can find out more about the device from livescribe.com. Uh, the smart pen um, is a fantastic device. I, I cannot recommend this too much. It's something I think is great for students to use within the classroom to record content that they encounter, but it's also something that you can use to share content with your students. Now, the company was founded by Jim uh, McGrath. He was um, a gentleman who created LeapFrog. So those of you with small kids may have encountered a device that's similar to the LiveScribe Pulse Pen that was manufactured by LeapFrog. So the concept may be already familiar to you. But do not be deceived, the smart pen is definitely a device for student and faculty. With the package, you receive a couple of items. You get the smart pen, you get a headset microphone that you can plug in to the top of the pen, you get a docking station that connects via USB that allows you to move content on and off your pen, and then journals, little books that you can write in. Now the pen works in a very clever way. It has a couple of notable features. It has built-in microphones on the device. At the end of the pen, there's an audio jack that allows you to plug in the optional headset microphone. In the middle of the device, we have the speaker, which will playback recordings directly from the pen. And then beside the pen and nib, we have a camera which uses infrared to record where the pen is positioned above paper. The paper that you use is proprietary. It's dot paper, and it works a little bit like GPS. As the pen moves above the paper, it reads the dots and is able to work out the exact location of the pen on the paper. Smart idea, really, really clever. Now, you're not restricted to using the dot paper that Livescribe sells you. You can print your own paper providing you have a laser printer that has um, pretty high fidelity. The ability to print at um, a great level of detail. So if you have an older laser printer, this may not be an option for you to consider. But if you have a more recent laser printer, you can print your own paper. Um, the pen is clever in that it uses ink that does not register with the infrared camera. So when you scribble over the dots, this doesn't prevent the pen from reading the dots and knowing where you are. Again, very, very clever concepts here. In terms of system requirements, this will work on PCs or Macs. So sadly, Linux isn't really an option here, although some folks have attempted workarounds. And there is competition. There are a couple of devices that do things in a similar fashion but not as well as the Livescribe Pulse. Notable examples here are the Iogea Mobile Digital Scribe or the Dane Elect Z Pen. These devices don't use smart paper. They use um, devices which you affix to a pad that work out roughly where the pen is above the paper. Because you don't have this degree of precision, these devices don't work quite as well. They don't also have the audio synchronization that the Livescribe Pulse Pen has. So clever gadgets, but I wouldn't use them myself and I don't recommend them. So what does the Pulse do? Well, it digitizes what you write and draw. It synchronizes this with optional audio that you can record. So basically it records what you write and draw and the environment in which you're in. It can do basic text translation. So if you write something down, you can use optical character recognition to translate this to digital text, or you can translate this text between languages. This is something that has not been fully explored. There is a demo that comes with the pen and there's additional software that can translate from English to Spanish. Um, the pen also works as a basic calculator. Um, you can do simple arithmetic. It can play music back, mus sorry, it can play back music if you draw a keyboard on the paper, you can play simple tunes. 
It can also play movies on the screen on the pen. This is really a gimmick rather than something of particular use, but just sharing it with you. Um, but it also provides a platform for other software. And here's where I see this device. Um, here, here's where I see the potential for this device. You could create the best possible distance learning course with this device by sending prepackaged books using this dot paper to your students and sending files which your students download onto their smart pens. As they open the book, they read the content that you've provided, which is printed on this dot paper. If they clink on elements on the page with their pen, this can play back audio that you have recorded. So you can have audio accompanying the text in the book. You can also provide the opportunity for students to engage in exercises, content that they write in the book. When they synchronize, when they dock their pen, the content that the students have created can be sent back to you for you to assess and grade. So you could create a distance learning course which is packaged and developed through a book and a pen that you send your students. They're not using a computer as they engage with your material. The pen and the book are objects which most people are eminently familiar with. Books are basically the repositories of knowledge that people have recognized for hundreds of years. Pens are extension of the mind and the body that allow us to become as creative as we can be. So we're using tools that people are comfortable with rather than sticking them in front of a computer. So this would be a fantastic platform for somebody to develop the best possible online course. I haven't seen this happen yet. This is something I would love to do, but I don't have the resources to do this myself. So hopefully this message will get around. Hopefully this will inspire you or people you know to do something like this. And if you do, please tell me. I would be over the moon to hear somebody do this. As I say, this could be the best distance learning course that you could create. Now, an example of how you could use this is you can bring this device into the classroom with you. If you have an overhead projector, you can come into the classroom with your pen and your book. You can talk to your students and write content into the book, which goes out through the overhead projector. And then you can share this almost immediately after the class. Livescribe has a community site that allows you to do this and it creates flash videos which you can embed in Facebook or your own web pages. You can do this in a private or a public fashion. So if you were to visit my website www.depaul.edu slash tilde j more slash barefoot you can see an example of this or you can go to Livescribe and if you go into the community there you can search for me and you can see some of the recordings that I have created in the past. Anyway, that was the presentation. Hopefully this was of value to you. If you want to get in touch, you can give me a telephone call. You can email me at jmore at depaul.edu. You can visit my website, www.depaul.edu slash tilde jmore. Or you can visit, visit the dedicated site created for this workshop www.depaul.edu slash tilde jmore slash barefoot. This site is essentially a blog. You can append comments to each of the blog entries that are created. On this site, you can download PDFs, you can watch videos. Everything that I've shared at this workshop is available for you to share with your colleagues to give out to the wider world. I'd be very happy to hear your feedback and to continue the conversation.